I'm going to take you on a little journey with me, a journey of entrepreneurship. But just before I do, one question. Hands up those of you who, like me, consider yourselves entrepreneurs. Okay, entrepreneurial. Okay, for all of you that didn't actually put your hands up, don't worry, because the reason why I always ask this question is when I was your age, if someone had asked me to put my hand up as to whether or not I was an entrepreneur, I would have never put my hand up either. Um, I thought when I was growing up, in a way, the idea of an entrepreneur, we just had Richard Branson. And I would sort of compare myself to Richard Branson and think, well, there's no way I am like Richard Branson. You know, I thought you have to have a special chromosome to be an entrepreneur, some sort of a magic dust. Or at least, like Richard Branson, you had to be a school dropout, which I wasn't in any way. Um, so looking at him, and now you guys, on top of Richard Branson, you've got the dragons, which are terrifying images of entrepreneurship, and the apprentice. So clearly, I thought, I'm not at all the entrepreneurial type. I didn't love business in kindergarten. I didn't make my first million selling sweets at the school playground. So basically, I thought, clearly, I'm not at all the entrepreneur. So I actually went off, and I became the opposite of an entrepreneur. I went off and became a lawyer. Um, but very quickly, I realized that actually I had chosen completely the wrong career for my personality because there are just about two things going for me, my optimism and my enthusiasm. And quickly, I realized that just about the two qualities you don't need to be a good lawyer, optimistic or enthusiastic. So I was sort of wasted in what I was doing. And just work felt like I was leaving myself behind to go to work. Work felt like incredibly boring, really. It was just, it was, I just did it for the paycheck. I just went in every day not being able to be me. And I remember thinking, why is this not fun? And I was just asking my work colleagues, saying, guys, you know, why aren't we having fun? And I remember they said, fun at work? They're not paying you to enjoy yourself. And I just refused to accept that, because I thought, you know what, I'm going to be working the best years of my life, most of my waking hours. So how on earth could work not be fun? How could I accept this? Um, so I ended up basically staying there because sometimes you really have a dream, but it's scary to change because um, you're in a sort of comfort zone in a way. And I ended up staying at the law firm, sort of really hating it, but thinking this is life, this is working life. Um, until something happened which really snapped me out of it. And sometimes you get shocks, you get dreadful shocks that happen which snap you out of things. Um, what happened to me was I come from a close family of four, my mum and dad, my brother and I. And in January 1993, my dad died very suddenly, very unexpectedly. And I remember the shock was so big, it was like my world had fallen apart. And I just remember the very next morning I came back from hospital and I thought, do you know what, actually, this comfort zone is an illusion. I've got to be true to myself and I've got to do something I absolutely love doing because this is not it. And I've got to do something where I could be me doing it. So I basically took a big jump. I took a big leap. I left the law firm. I had no idea what I was going to do. But actually, my motto in life is leap and the net will appear. And I just really believe you've got to take the jump sometimes. So I basically took this jump. I went to visit my brother, Bobby who was my only sibling, so he was working in New York at the time. I went to visit him in New York. I had terrible jet lag, thinking, you know, I'm just going to take some time, be in New York, have some change of air. Um, and I remember the very first morning I got up thinking, with this terrible jet lag, thinking, let me go and get a cup of coffee. And back then, America was known for horrible coffee. Even we would make fun of American coffee. And I remember just walking down Madison Avenue, and I was sort of hit by the smell of freshly ground coffee beans. Um, this is even before Starbucks had come to New York. But I walked into this coffee bar. There was all the smell of coffee, where the coffee came from. I said, can I have a cappuccino, please? And they said, would you like it with full-fat milk, skim milk, semi-skim milk, soya milk? And you know, I sort of just couldn't believe it. I'm always on some sort of a diet, so I couldn't believe I could get a skinny cappuccino. You know, and I just fell in love with it, and I just didn't think anything of it. And I got back to London, and I was actually sitting um, with Bobby in a Thai restaurant with my mum. We'd just gone out for a Thai meal. 
And in the middle of this time, I said to my brother how much I miss these coffee bars. I just wish we had them in London. And I couldn't believe that I was stuck at home. There was no, nowhere to start my morning apart from making some instant coffee. And I wish we had those amazing New York style coffee bars so I could go and have a skinny latte every morning. And as soon as I said this to my brother, he got the light bulb you hear about. He said, I can't believe you've said this. This is incredible. You and I should be the ones to bring American style coffee bars to the UK. This is like an amazing amazing business idea. And my reaction was, hang on a minute, Bobby, you got me completely wrong. I meant why didn't someone else open it and for me to go to it. In a way, I was the customer, so I couldn't quite understand why I had to provide a solution for my own problem, in a way. It's, but anyway, my brother was having none of it. He said, you know what, if you don't want to do it, I'll pay you to do research for me. And just because my brother was paying me, basically, the next day, I got myself a one-day tube pass, and I got on the circle line. And that was the first day of my research. I got off at every single of the stops on the circle line to see for myself what there was, and I could see the crap quality of coffee everyone was getting. And by the evening, when I got back, that was really the night when I thought, you know what, there's a real gap in the market, and if we bring American-style coffee bars to the UK, it's going to work. But the thing is, you know, I didn't think 100%, I just thought about 1% this is going to work. I wasn't 100% sure. So one side of my brain is, this is, a, this is amazing, there's a gap in the market. But this left, left side of my brain is telling me, surely, Sahar, what do you know about coffee bars? This isn't going to work, it's too good to be true. Just because you like drinking skinny lattes doesn't mean this is a brilliant business idea. But what I've learned in life is that whenever you want to do something, these doubts, and I'm sure you're growing up, and the more you grow up, the more you hear these doubts, these doubts are always going to be there, and you must never stop them. So my solution is when you start doubting yourself, when you start feeling insecure, you basically press the delete button. Because if you don't press delete, listening to that voice, you think it's the voice of reason, it's not, it's the voice of fear. And fear is a zero-sum game. There's no point indulging in it. So we didn't press delete. The next step was, OK, let's go and do some research. Because a lot of it is about doing homework, making sure there's room for it, making sure there's a market for it. And the problem was, well, Bobby and I, we had no idea about this. We were clueless about this business. In a way, I worked as a lawyer all my life, my brother as a banker. So we were entering this world we are completely clueless about. Clueless about retail, clueless about coffee, clueless about catering. But one law I've got in both my books, I call the importance of being clueless. So never worry about not knowing, never worry about ha not having expertise. Not knowing is actually good because you can teach yourself, and you can teach yourself with the fresh information. And basically, once you start jumping in, and that's what my brother told me, don't worry about not knowing, because you're about to go to the best business school in the world, right bang in the middle of this. So you will teach yourself as you go along, never worry about that, and being an outsider is a huge advantage. So basically, we were outsiders, we gave ourselves three months to learn all there was about coffee. At this point, we moved back to live at home with my mum, which you can imagine is a bit of a come down if you've like, moved away and then you move back in with your mum and your brother at a certain age. But anyway, we did that and we just gave ourselves three months to become experts. I can't tell you, we just drank as many coffees as possible. I once almost actually killed myself ODing on 26 espressos in the course of a morning because no one had told me you have to spit it out and not drink them. So we did that. Then I said, you know what, let me go back to New York um, on a reconnaissance mission because when I was in New York, I just had no idea that we wanted to copy this. So I said to my brother, I'll go back to New York. And I went back to New York. I took some disposable cameras, which is what we had, and started taking a picture of this coffee bar, which was the predecessor to Starbucks of every single little thing they do. And of course, as I'm doing this, the manager is getting quite pissed off. So she noticed that I was taking a picture of every single thing so we can copy it. And just she followed me onto the pavement and confiscated my cameras. So I basically thought, oh my God, there's just, you know, I've got to come back home without pictures of this coffee bar with the manager finding out. So I ended up doing something that entrepreneurs do that you all do in everyday life. It's just that entrepreneurs use it for business, bootstrapping. Basically, in order to come back 
to London with pictures of the coffee bar without the manager finding out. My bootstrapping solution was I had a couple of cousins who lived in New York, and me and my cousins pretended as if we were innocent New York tourists taking innocent tourist snapshots of each other. You will see a picture of my cousin coming up, lovely. You hardly see my cousin there, which is the point. But you fully see how they display their pastries, what everything looks like. Again, another cousin showing the bar seating. This is the first time I've seen employees wear t-shirts and baseball caps. And this is um, another cousin. So basically, we took these clandestine pictures. And this is the, the picture I drew on the back of the Virgin flight back from New York. Um, I've kept this because I genuinely believe there's no point having ideas in your head. Ideas are worthless. You've got to make them happen. Stop putting them on paper. If you're inspired after today, start putting stuff on paper. It starts happening. And another thing for us, we were coming up with a brand. Imagine coming up with a brand when you've got no idea about branding. And we knew we had to be up there, you know, on the high street with those big players, and we had no idea. But, you know, that's the thing about entrepreneurship, is just trial and error. And sometimes you make a fool of yourself, as I'm about to share with you a logo that we actually considered. Lovely, you can imagine this would have been nice and out of date. But you know, that's the thing, entrepreneurship is not a genius tendency. It's about trial and error until you get things right. Then we wrote this business plan. Again, the business plan wasn't the right name, but we wrote it. When he, the word business plan came up, I have to tell you, I was terrified. I said to my brother, do you know what? Let me go through business school and I'll come back in two years and I'll write a business plan. And my brother said, do you know what? Actually, all the business plan is, is answering a few questions. What is it you're going to do? How are you going to do it? How much is it going to cost you? And who are you going to do it with? And anyway, in this plan, we calculated we needed to raise 90 grand to open the first store. Just to give you an idea, we started calling random bank managers off the yellow pages, basically. Um, we got rejections from 40 bank managers. Um, this is, page goes on and on. I'm just sharing with you the first page. Of the 40 bank managers we called, we got interviews with 20 bank managers. Of the 20 we got interviews with, the first 19 said to us, there is no way we'll give you money to open a coffee bar. We said, why on earth not? They said, it's really obvious, isn't it? We were like, what's obvious? They were like, it's, ob it's obvious. We're a nation of tea drinkers. You know, Britain is famous for tea drinking, so what the hell are you doing bringing coffee in a nature tea drinkers? But I'd done my homework, and yes, we were a nature tea drinkers, but basically in the 80s we were drinking four times more tea than we were drinking two times more tea, so I'm seeing this is going the right way, which is why us um, entrepreneurs call bank managers enemies of innovation. This is just a quick um, fax I wrote to my brother about a certain bank manager, which you'll see. Um, it's just all, you know, sort of this, the life of entrepreneurs. We're not perfect. Um, this is the picture of the bank manager. <laughs> and basically, um, the next one was making it happen. You know, you've got to actually do it. And that was a nightmare. Every, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it's an obstacle course. Everyone's against you. Um, we were looking for cups. No one had these cups. At that time, all they had was polystyrene cups. The cup suppliers thought we were crazy. They were like, I don't know what you're going on about. We've never had cups like this. We ended up bootstrapping. We, did, we ordered blank cups from America. We had two parties, five bottles of wine, some pasta, got all our friends, and they stuck the stickers on the cups. The same thing with the muffin suppliers. They were like, blueberry muffins, fat-free muffins? Sorry, the only muffins we've ever baked are yellow. The only thing they've got in them are raisins. So we ended up making the muffins at home, delivering them ourselves, getting more parking tickets, delivering them ourselves. And we ended up nicking our first employees from Pret-a-Manger. This is all bootstrapping stuff that all entrepreneurs do. And basically, we opened the doors to the first store. This is the first store. Just to show you, entrepreneurship is not necessarily about original or new ideas. It was a copy. The benches came later, so it was a complete copy of what we've seen in New York. And basically, this was the first coffee bar of its kind to open in the UK. Just to give you an idea, it was a disaster. When I say disaster, our break-even sales were 700 pounds, and every single day we were making 200 pounds of sales a day. And when I say 200 pounds of sales a day, I'm discounting my mum, who's coming and drinking as many cappuccinos as humanly possible. So without my mum's excessive coffee consumption, we were making much less. This is just you know, telling people what we're about, educating people about 
about coffee. And one by one, sort of, you know, we converted one customer at a time. Sales started creeping towards break even. Starbucks came, it was an absolutely terrifying time. But by this stage, we were a big brand. And when we got to 2001, basically, Bobby and I both sold our shares because we thought that's what you do when your company is successful. Huge mistake. I remember when I sold my shares, instead of celebrating, I'd taken my mom, we'd gone to celebrate um, to America, and instead of celebrating, I was so upset that apparently, according to my mom, in the British Airways lounge, I started reading the story in the Financial Times, the story of us leaving, and instead of kind of celebrating, I was crying so hysterically, people must have been thinking, what could be quite so sad in the FT that this girl is bawling her eyes out? Um, but that for me is entrepreneurship. Out of boredom, I started writing my book. I always visualize, this is my visualization of the book. Um, I wrote this book, and this book was almost my Auntie Richard Branson book, saying, do you know what, actually, if we did it, then anyone can do it. And this myth we have that entrepreneurship is a special chromosome is rubbish. Don't listen to the dragons then. It's not a personality trait, entrepreneurship everyone's got it. You don't need skills or expertise. You become an entrepreneur. It's a process. Um, it's something, you don't need to be an entrepreneur before you start. No one is determined in advance if they're an entrepreneur. You become one when you start. And when you start, basically, there are five steps to entrepreneurship. And my brother taught me these steps, and I want to share you these steps, because going, going through every step from A to B, you turn into an entrepreneur. Step one, the idea. Make sure it's something you love. The beauty about entrepreneurship is you don't have to live someone else's life. You find something you love, and I guarantee what you love doing, you will be good at, and vice versa. What you hate doing, you'll be crap at. So you might as well stick to what you love doing. And what you love doing activates the entrepreneur within you, because all of us have an entrepreneur within, we just need to bring it out. So make sure you find the star within you and do it and jump. That is the idea that's gonna bring out all these wonderful qualities about yourself you never knew you even had. Had I stayed a lawyer, I would have thought I was a pretty mediocre lawyer. I would have never known I have all this creativity within me. And that's the journey for you. Number two, do your market research. Lazy people can't become entrepreneurs. You have to be thorough, you have to know your market back to front. So you have to do your homework. There is no substitute for hard work. That's why it's not about genius tendencies, it's about hard work. Do your business plan, you've got to be organized. It's just, it's a really easy thing, it's just a couple of questions, and just, but you have to organize. Raising money, People are gonna say no to you. We got 40 no's, guess what? Howard Schultz of Starbucks got 275 no's. J.K. Rowling, 12 people said her manuscript for Harry Potter was rubbish. So you've gotta have stickability in entrepreneurship. You've gotta make it happen, because making it happen is about doing. Doing brings self-belief. I never had self-belief when I started, I had 1%. But self-belief doesn't grow on trees, self-belief comes when you start doing, when you're committed, when you go on journey. That's how you gain your self-belief. And my last point, don't give up. Entrepreneurship is difficult. It's not a fairy tale. Everyone's against you. Everyone tells you your idea's rubbish. It won't work. The critics come out. But it is an absolutely incredible journey if you learn to stick with it. It is a journey where you find things about yourself you never knew you had. Every single one of you has a star within you. And entrepreneurship is an amazing journey where you find that star within you. And all I can tell you is, in my life, it is something as well that's where you combine what you do and who you are. So work doesn't become the opposite of life. Work and life are the same thing. And I can tell you, it's a difficult journey, but it's a wonderful journey. And I, in my life, have absolutely never met an unhappy entrepreneur. That's my story. Thank you very much. Thank you.